In this video, we will discuss what is referred to as a thermally fully developed flow. So as we had stated in the previous video, we have three temperatures, all of which can vary in the axial direction. And a combination of these temperatures defines a non-dimensional temperature in a manner that will become a little bit clearer as we move through this process, we will define a flow as being thermally fully developed when the spatial derivative of the non-dimensional temperature equals zero, which of course means that the non-dimensional temperature is a constant as a function of x. There are two cases that meet this condition. The first of these cases is where the heating of the tube is controlled by a uniform surface heat flux. In other words, QS double prime is a constant. If this is the case, the surface temperature of the tube must vary with a function of x. The second case is for a uniform surface temperature, meaning TS is a constant. For this situation, the heat flux must vary as a function of x. Now, if we take the requirement of thermally fully developed flow and we combine that with Newton's law of cooling as it is applied to convective heat transfer within a tube where the temperature difference is defined as Ts minus the mean temperature at any given x location, the combination of those two will yield a result where the term h over k is not a function of x meaning h over k is a constant. In most situations that we'll be dealing with, k, the thermal conductivity of the fluid, is a constant. So we then would find out that h, the heat transfer coefficient, will also be a constant. Now looking at the figure in the lower left-hand corner, we see that in different cases, the velocity boundary layer and the thermal boundary layer will grow at different rates. In the case of a Prandtl number equal to one, we would typically find that the velocity and the thermal boundary layers coalesce at more or less the exact same point. Now, once the velocity boundary layer becomes established and fully developed, we find that the friction coefficient also becomes constant. Once the thermal boundary layer becomes fully developed, we then find that the heat transfer coefficient is also a constant. Just as a reminder, Last semester, when we introduced the Moody diagram, we did see that for all cases where the flow became wholly turbulent, the friction factor became a constant. So it should not be that surprising to find that the heat transfer coefficient, which is the corollary of the friction factor for the thermal boundary layer, is also a constant once the flow becomes fully established.